Paper men meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Tingling ling, city desk. Pull the press, pull the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's a mess meets the test. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. Media Project is a half hour of commentary and analysis where you have some veteran journalists talking about what's been going on in the media, oftentimes taking a local eye to what is happening nationally, and we welcome you to join us for the next half hour. I'm Rex Smith, formerly editor of the Times Union, now with the Upstate American, here joined by Judy Patrick, the former editor of the Daily Gazette, vice president of the New York Press Association, Barbara Lombardo, formerly executive editor of the Saratogian and the Record in Troy, and Mike Spain, the former associate editor of the Times Union, my colleague there. Hello, y'all. Hello, yeah. Rex. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. We'll work on our choral ensemble work going forward after the show is off the air. Anyway, we have a lot to talk about here. One thing that's interesting I was struck by, a couple things coming from the UN Climate Conference. One coming from a piece written by a longtime local meteorologist named David Schechter, works for a station out in the Midwest somewhere, who is talking about how difficult it is to talk about climate change when you're a local reporter, even though, as a NASA climate scientist put it, we're more sure that greenhouse gas emissions cause climate change than we are that smoking causes cancer. You know, this is true. Climate change is happening, and it's being caused by humans, but it is very difficult somehow for local reporters to deal with it. And I think it's true in print as well as on broadcast. Why is that, do you suppose? Well, one of the reasons this reporter talked about was the fact that whenever he would try to do this, the climate deniers would barrage his station with complaints. And I think there's that faction out there. If you get hammered too often with complaints about your reporting, management will start to listen to it and will discourage you from pursuing this. I think one of the ways you could develop climate-related stories is to do the stories, just don't use the word climate change. Um, <laughs> you know, do the stories about the changing gardening zone. Do the stories about the changing bird migration routes. Do the stories about the heat waves or the smoke pollution from forest fires in Canada. Just don't use the word climate change, and maybe you can slip those stories in. <laughs> you mean you can inform people without them realizing that you're teaching them about climate change? That sounds brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and it, the decisions to cover things have to come from the top. Mm -hmm. you can, definitely the reporters need to stand by their guns and say what they think needs to be covered and make a case for why it needs to be covered. But making it happen has to come from the top. And if the people at the top don't care or don't want to do it for fear of making people in their audience angry, for fear of losing advertisers, it is going to be a very costly decision on their part. Right. So that involves both news directors at local TV stations and general managers who are, that is the difference between the news side and the revenue side. Same thing is true of editors and publishers. You know, you need to have that support. That's why leadership does actually matter. Yeah. In the case of this Texas weather reporter, and that's an interesting question by itself, is the weather person on your local TV station a journalist? Do they have an obligation to teach you about climate change by any name? Or is it simply that they're reporting what the National Weather Service says will be your weather over the next several days and what to expect and talk about some of the phenomena like, you know, meteorological rivers or whatever they're called and just sort of talk about that? Or do they have a, an obligation as a journalist to be talking about the issue of climate change and not skirting the fact that there is a huge scientific consensus that says we can uh, have an impact on climate change. We can take steps to 
mitigate climate change and we ought to be doing it? Or is that stepping over the line? I mean, is your local weatherman a journalist? You right. would hope. I mean, you would you would think. But I think it's a valid question as to whether they see themselves as doing that or whether their role is simply to be a front, as you say, right? Or mm-hmm. that a cold content. front. Mm-hmm. A cold front. <laughs> <laughs> but a boom. Right. And there was an issue maybe 10 or 15 years ago in this market about whether or not the weather people were meteorologists, if you remember that. Certainly the weather on local radio and on local television is one of the most highly viewed aspects of any news report. They spend a lot of time telling us whether or not to bring an umbrella or whether or not to get the snow off our windshields. It seems like they have the expertise to drop a little bit more information into their weather cast rather than, you know, tell me whether or not I'm going to need suntan lotion. Although I would think that the job of the weather person, the meteorologist, and the news people have to dovetail on this because some of those things would not be in the purview of what's the weather going to be tonight? What's the weather going to be like for the next few days? That's different than educating the public on the broader issues. And so I don't think it should all fall onto the shoulders of the weather person. Oh, not at all. I mean, it's a business story. It's certainly a a story about farming, interviewing local farmers about when they plant which crops and how that has changed and how they adapt. That's all completely legitimate. I mean, the farmers know already, you know, talk to a dermatologist. Dermatologists know already the effects of climate change and This is broad reporting that is not strictly supposed to be on the the person who delivers the weather, but but they're not exempt from telling the truth that these forest fires in Canada that is affecting our air now are the result of a drier, longer, hotter summer season, you know, and they can explain it. They have the audience because, as Judy, you said so perfectly, people tune in for the weather. They want to know the weather. They want to know what to wear tomorrow or what jackets their kid needs tomorrow going to school. And that's the opportunity to explain why this phenomena happens and not just tell them the results. We're going to get a cold front in tomorrow and your kid needs a jacket. Part of the difficulty, according to this uh, local weathercaster who has made this point, David Schechter, is that hardly any local news managers have any training in even the basics of climate science. And so they're not prepared to back this up. And then you get the, the general managers whose job is to bring in revenue. And in some markets, there is non-local ownership. So, for example, the media group Sinclair owns Channel 6 in the capital region. Salem owns a Channel 10 in the uh, local market. And that's an important thing for us to know, that that is uh, some of what is coming over the airwaves gets dictated by corporate ownership elsewhere. So these are important things. But the additional fact that is interesting to note is the role of national media, right-wing media in particular, like Fox News, in denigrating the talk about climate change, in targeting it, in fact. What's happened on on Fox News recently with the reports coming out of the uh, UN Global Climate Summit, COP28, as it was called, you have been getting a lot of Fox News commentary on this one particular point that cold kills more than heat and therefore there must not be such a thing as climate change uh, or global warming because people are actually freezing to death. Yeah, and I think some make the point that if it's true that things are getting warmer, that's not so bad because fewer people will die if, if it's warmer because more people die from the cold. It sounds perfectly logical, but it it ignores so many other aspects of this. And as the, the piece points out, a lot of that rhetoric, which is not brand new, comes from cherry picking data and not putting it in context. And it needs to be put in context to understand that it's more than just people dying from heat. It's people's whole lives changing, people moving away from uh, coastal areas, people, their living is changed. They cannot farm. They cannot live where they live. There's parts of Texas that are so parched they can't even plant uh, crops anymore. They, they burn right up. And it's changing lifestyles. It's changing uh, our food supply. It's, it's costing us a whole lot. And that comes back to hit local media because people will watch Fox News, they will watch right-wing media, and they will get these ideas in their head. And when they see the local newspaper, their local radio station or television station mention climate change, they will get on the phone because they they have a connection there and they will complain about it. And then 
the result will be a pullback of coverage. I mean, it, it, what happens at the national level, especially in the right-wing media, uh, foments these kinds of criticisms that editors get all the time. I mean, I, I saw it for years. Yeah, activists are also behind it. It's a, important to point out that very few people, a couple of people, one person, can make a big stink and get a few other people to do it, use uh, sock puppets, if that's a word anymore, use fake identities on the Internet to post things on various social media platforms and create what looks like a whole lot of objection when it's really just one or two people's interpretation of something, too. And it, it, it's always a challenge to recognize that because it, it, it does appear that there might be a tide going against certain coverage when it might just be one angry person or a couple of angry person in the audience. And that complicates the whole process. Well, the right-wing media ecosystem is sophisticated at amplifying some of these oddities. Uh, Take Alex Jones, for example, who recently has been returned to uh, X, formerly Twitter. It is hard to imagine, but that is the truth. He's Isn't back. Something? He's back. Uh, this is the guy who, remember, claimed that the Sandy Hook murders of school children was a, a fake, uh, that parents had staged this. I mean, that's disgusting. And he was fined, an order, a court ordered him to be fined a billion dollars for that. I believe that was the number. Right. That was the damages that he, he was, uh, that the court recognized that he had inflicted on, in pain and suffering on the families that were already in terrible agony over the loss of their children. But Elon Musk has brought him back, thinking his voice apparently is really essential to the uh, uh, new Twitter, to X, which, folks, you shouldn't be on anymore. And the problem is that it, that, that kind of stuff actually does draw an audience, and where there is an audience, there is advertising. So advertisers are now appearing once again alongside hateful, uh, distorted content, and you would think that the advertisers wouldn't want to be a part of that. Remember back in the back in the day when jets used to drop out of the sky or crash regularly in the '60s and '70s? Mm-hmm. There was this un- contract that yeah. you had with airlines and advertising agencies that that you yes, yeah. where if there was an airline ad in the newspapers, remember those good old days? Those ads would be pulled whenever there was a, a crash because. They didn't want to have their airline ads touting airline travel when everybody was thinking about airlines. Similarly, there was, if you had a cigarette ad in the newspaper, part of the contract was that it couldn't appear on an opposite page where the same page, the advertising couldn't be next to a story about cancer. And Which was uh, problematic if you were actually laying out a page. If you were a copy editor, you had to know what the content of an ad was, which wasn't in the old days always possible. Uh, we later. never paid attention. To that. <laughs> yeah, whoever paid attention. <laughs> then you got something called WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. You got a computer screen that actually would show you the ad as you were putting a page together. How wonderful is that? Mm. But then, of course, advertising disappeared from newspapers anyway, so it hardly mattered. <laughs> so, so in the digital age, you have this thing called programmatic advertising, and it's th- these ads that will pop up on a, a news site just regularly without a lot of control. Uh, what happened, what I did when I encountered, I would encounter problematic ads. I would not want this ad of, uh, it was an offensive ad for some reason or another. It was, you know, something we were getting probably one one thousandth of a cent for, for every impression. And you can, you could block them, but it's only after the fact, after it's appeared on your website that can, you can block it. The lack of control news organizations have over their their websites is ast- has remains astounding to me. Right. They hand over that uh, to a third party that brokers these ads, and, and as you say, it's a fraction of a penny that when it appears or pops up on, on the owner of the website's internet page. On, uh, on a bright note, yeah. there is a woman who has a nonprofit company that is aiming to address just that. The Washington Post had a very good article about that. And it was kind of exciting that she is she and her little company have figured out how to uh, look at the impact of the right. It basically is most mostly, if not all, right wing lies. And then turn right to the advertisers and say, are you sure you want to be associated with this? And she has had some success. The woman's name is Nandini Jami. 
and she posts right away as soon as she sees some of this stuff like uh, ads Jones. alongside yeah. Alex Jones uh, and says, let's reach out to these advertisers to let them know that they are alongside content that is not trustworthy. I don't know how she gets her funding for this company, but I hope it continues. Well, it can't be a profit-making company. <laughs> right, right, and I think the I think there will always be advertisers that will go for any impression anywhere that they yeah. can, but the ultimate aim for her likely is the fact that it will be less and less profitable, that these ads will be will will not give Alex Jones as much money that they will they won't cost as much that their value will decline um, because uh, it will be not a high priority uh, listing for any of any legitimate advertisers again I think there are some advertisers will go wherever they can find an impression and again as you said programmatic advertising that is it's automatic it, there is an instantaneous auction process that goes on between uh, websites that have available space, whatever that term was, and the advertisers so that uh, those ads sitting out there waiting for a place to go can get placed onto thousands of websites instantaneously so that you don't really know what it is that's appearing there on your site until it's too late, and there it is. Well, advertisers will make decisions about where to advertise and how much to spend on advertising uh, to, to reach a particular audience. If a, if a website or a uh, social media platform is popular among young people, they'll, uh, they'll target their ads if they have a product that appeals to young people. If it's senior citizens, you know, they'll, they'll hit the AARP website and places like that. And uh, many times they know exactly where they're advertising and where they want to spend it. But often it just appears when they do broad advertising, like you're describing, Rex and Judy, and made aware of it, they, many of them uh, feel responsible to take their ads down or make sure that they are not included in the package that goes randomly to places that would uh, be like Alex Jones promoting uh, right-wing conspiracy theories and hate speech. Here's another new place where they can go. Tucker Carlson has started his own network, the Tucker Carlson Network. And you folks can subscribe for $72 a year. Now, you may only get like one little piece of commentary uh, per day. But by golly, uh, if you want to support Tucker, there you go. And he'll be open to this kind of advertising all the time. Yeah, he's calling it Tucker Carlson Network. <laughs> and um, But it's not a network. It's really just a, a, a website and a pay site, and it's hardly even a streaming service, So, although he's trying to portray it as that. You know, there's diehards who miss Tucker Carlson's uh, nighttime commentaries who probably will go out and, and look for it and pay for it, but uh, he's not going to have the massive audience that Fox News gave him. I'm afraid to poo-poo his power that mm -hmm. lively. The, it's nine bucks a month. People spend that without really thinking about it. He had millions of fo followers on Fox, and he has that horribly charismatic personality <laughs> to those people who can stand him. Yeah, they can listen to the Media Project for free, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So, or you can download it yeah, and so, listen so anytime. It, so, you know, he can get underwriting from other sources as well to keep it afloat, and it yeah. does. So I hope that you're right, Mike. Yeah, yeah. People, when it yeah. comes, when push comes to sur to shove, does somebody really want to shell out any money to hear something they don't really care? But I think the potential is his, there. His it fans, worries me. His fans will find him, I guess. And, and the question is how much, how many fans he really has and how, how dedicated the fans are. But uh, he has something to say, and he wants to say it. Right, and, we're, and we're helping to publicize that he's available. <laughs> and, and he's promising like an uncensored view of Tucker Carlson, which kind of is scary in, in mm. and of itself. What has he been holding back on <laughs> Fox? Oh, boy. Yeah, you would wonder. If you're just listening, uh, just tuning us in, folks, it's a media project from Northeast Public Radio. I'm Rex Smith here with Judy Patrick, Barbara Lombardo, and Mike Spain. And if you want to share your thoughts, media at wamc.org media that is and uh, you can uh, share your thoughts some of these topics by the way have been sent to us by listeners thank you Glenn in uh, wherever you are yeah, we don't get enough letters we you? don't get enough letters that's true but we can take more always the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is under attack by Senator Ted Cruz of Texas because they have some diversity requirements for community service grants. 
That is, uh, Corporation of Public Broadcasting uh, sends out some money to help to create community advisory boards, uh, to help stations, uh, public broadcasting stations, uh, support their uh, community relations. And there are some diversity requirements there to be sure that they're serving the range of populations. Cruz, Ted Cruz, however, says that uh, it's violating the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, uh, which you may recall the 14th Amendment came about as a result of the end of slavery, uh, trying to ensure the rights of equal protection under the law. You would say. uh, Cruz says that uh, no, diversity is undermining pluralism and individuality. Um, And uh, so he is taking aim at this. And I think it is a serious thing when a U.S. senator begins to uh, threaten the funding stream of an organization that supports journalism, as the Corporation of Public Broadcasting does. It's community advisory boards to represent your community. So if your community is diverse, the only true and genuine way to have a community advisory board would be to have diversity that is reflects your audience. And, and, and you're that, that way you'll get advice from the whole community and not just the hand-picked people that might end up on one of those boards. It, it's, you know, it, it goes back to when we all were in newspapers trying to hire people and looking for diversity. We wanted people in the newsroom who were representative of, of our community. That's a challenge, and it, it, we weren't always very successful. But it made us a better newspaper when we had people from all different backgrounds, all different ethnic groups, uh, all uh, with different uh, ways of seeing the community. Our, our coverage was better when we had that. And, and, and I, community advisory boards will be much better if they are representative of the community. It's, it's ridiculous what he's doing. But Ted Cruz is just glomming on to the Republican talking points against diversity and inclusion and mocking it and uh, trying to show that public broadcasting doesn't deserve our support and it's well is it a do you think it's a a more a target of on diversity or is it the target on the media because certainly donald trump uh and his allies are well trump has said that he is, is going to get retribution on the media he has specifically cited uh msnbc and uh and uh, Comcast, which owns it, uh, and saying that if he is elected president, he's going to go after them. So, I'm, I mean, I wonder if it's diversity that they're going after, or is it directly going media? Well, think, think about it. It's public broadcasting that uh, Ted Cruz is going after, and public broadcasting tends to be extremely fair-minded in the way that it covers the news, and it doesn't have the slant that, uh, and and some perceive it because it doesn't have a right-wing slant, that it has a left-wing slant, which is another debate for another time. But because it is an objective, reasonable, sound news source, um, it's easy picking for somebody on the right. And so he's just using, because there are public funds involved, he's using his position to challenge all that. Yeah, I think for Cruz, this is a twofer. He gets to he gets to criticize diversity. He gets to criticize the Corporation for Broad, Public Broadcasting, which are both things that the Republicans are uh, against. It, it appears. You know, the, I agree that this the the idea of a diverse newsroom, diversity, and advisory boards is important. But it, it does make you wonder. It does make you worry a little bit about uh, if you take money from the government, then you get con- you, they can sometimes call the shots, and mm-hmm. that is disconcerting. Yeah, and it shows the difficulty of trying to do what I think is the right thing. If you have a newsroom, a, a broadcast newsroom or a print newsroom, and you're trying to make it more diverse, you're trying to make it more representative of the community that you're serving and of the country, um, you have to take special steps to make that happen. It does not happen organically. And, and here we are being told that uh, your funding can be at stake if you are trying to do the right thing. You know, Judy, you, you made a good point there. And, and uh, Thank what you, Mike. if No, I mean, <laughs> how, would, how, would that, how would that play in if New York passes the law that gives a, a, a tax break, basically, to media operations that, uh, that serve local communities? Will 
politicians then try to put strings on that and try to uh, control that? Right. That is that is a, a, a particular concern. It always has been, it, it, and it's an issue I think that public broadcast s- systems have long dealt with, and they maintain that they're able to you know, resist political pressure. But uh, we in the private sector media world, we would always get uh, pressure from advertisers, sure. from subscribers. Pressure is something that if you're in this business, you get used to resisting. Uh, but I agree with you, Mike, about um, a widespread uh, subs- subsidizing media comes with its comes with a price. However, if we don't get something like the tax breaks uh, for hiring in newsrooms, if there isn't something like uh, the uh, support for media that can come from foundations, if there isn't something that, that would enable journalism organizations to bargain directly with the big websites the, uh, that are taking all of the revenue, Google and Facebook and so on, if that doesn't happen, then we're going to have more news deserts. We're going to have more, more because newspapers. there are plenty already. Yeah, right. And there, and there are potential. There are plenty of potential solutions out there, and we just need to start activating them. And we'll talk more about those in a future show because we are out of time here. This is great. We've had Mike Spain and Barbara Lombardo and Judy Patrick, and I am Rex Smith. We have been your media projectors this week, thanks to our producer, Dave Gustina. We hope to see you again next week here on The Media Project. Now, newspaper men are such interesting people. They used to work like hell just for romance. But finally, the movies notwithstanding, they all got tired of patches on their pants. They organized a union to get a living wage. They joined with other actors upon a living stage. Now, newspaper. The Media Project is a national production of WAMC, Northeast Public Radio. This week's projectors include former Times Union editor and current Substack columnist of the Upstate American, Rex Smith, Judy Patrick, former editor of the Daily Gazette and vice president for editorial development for the New York Press Association, Barbara Lombardo, the former editor of the Saratogian and a journalism professor at the University at Albany, and former Times Union associate editor, Mike Spain. You can listen to The Media Project anytime at wamcpodcast.org or anywhere you get your podcast. I'm your producer, David Gustina. Thanks for listening. Has complained. Ah, but publishers have worries, for publishers must go to working folks for readers and to big shots for their dough. Now, publishers are such interesting people. It could be prostitution, I don't know. Ting a ling a ling, circulation, ting a ling a ling, advertising, get those readers, get that payoff. What a headache, what a mess. Oh, publishers are such interesting people. Let's give free cheers for freedom of the press.